my goal is to try to give you an, um, a host of information today um, that will help you become as effective a parent as you can be. And a lot of this is going to be based on, and I'll be trying to tie it into what we understand about how the human brain is operating. And because we are dealing with um, the age span between um, childhood and adolescence, we're also going to be talking some about how you know if your kid's brain is developing the way it's supposed to be. Um, and I also understand that lots of kids um, that are, you are the parents of lots of kids in this room that have a variety of challenges. And we'll be talking about some of those challenges and how um, to manage those also as a parent, all towards the aim of trying to create an independently functioning adult. Probably going to confirm some things you already know about parenting. Um, I also hope to challenge some things you know about parenting um, and give you some additional information and, and interesting and different ways to look at being a parent and what that means with kids today now that we are beginning to understand how their brains actually process information on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, one of the, the myths that I want to explode right off the bat is that there is no way to raise kids um, today. It all depends on the kid you've got. A lot of this is going to be individualized. There are some basic principles. I've, over the 25 plus years I've worked as a therapist, I'm a psychologist in private practice in the area, um, that helps a lot of families that works with kids that have LD, ADHD, um, emotional disorders, um, and, and helps them move towards independence. I've found that there's about four or five rules that I'm going to try and present to you guys today and some principles that go along with those rules that guide how to think about this whole process. But don't prescribe a specific way that you're supposed to do it. Um, there are multiple pathways to success when you start thinking about raising kids. Um, start off with a little joke. Uh, a little girl noticed that her mother had a couple of gray hairs appearing on her head, and she asked her mom, well, why is that? And the mom started thought for a minute, and she said, well, every time you do something naughty, I get a gray hair, and it, it makes me unhappy. The little girl sat back for a minute and she thought, and she said, is that why all of grandma's hairs are white? You must have been pretty tough. So, kids are like that. I don't think, I don't think it's the aging process that gets us, it's the kids that make us get older. Just real quick in terms, so I can get a sense of, of who, who's parenting what age kids in the room. How many people are parenting kids that are pre-K, kindergarten level? Got a couple. Okay, how about first and third grade? Got a couple more. How about fourth and fifth grade? Six through eight. Okay, high school age kids. Kids that haven't launched that are young adults. Yeah, okay, I was going to say you didn't have to raise your hand for that. Okay, so we've got a pretty wide spread. Good. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of that in terms of developmentally, what that means, and, and where we go with some of that. Um, parenting. question I would ask you is, which of these do you believe actually helps you become a better parent? Magic, hope, or science? There's actually one I forgot to put on there. And that's if you have a religious background prayer. A lot of parents um, are struggling with how to raise kids, particularly in this kind of a complex society. And my hope is that after you finish today, that this will integrate some information, maybe with what you already have, to help you understand that science is really helping us understand a lot about how to be better parents. Um, and we're going to focus actually on two aspects of parenting today. One is you as the parent, because that's an important component in parenting, and the other is your kid. So it's going to be a you-they um, kind of situation. I want to try and relate. Um, some of what I'm going to talk about today is science done in a way that I'm going to start asking you guys to think about yourselves, which is to be behavioral scientists. That every time you intervene with your kid, you actually are doing an experiment if you want to think about it that way. And there's things you can learn from how you intervene with your children if you pay attention to their behavior. And their behavior is always the thermometer that tells you how well the intervention's working. Whether it's working poorly or whether it's working well. Um, one of the other myths that I want to explode um, is that kids actually go to bed at night and they lay in their beds as we leave the room and they 
plan all night long about how to defeat us as adults and how to frustrate you at every turn when, when they get up in the morning. Now, I know there are lots of kids like that that behave in that way, but part of what I want to try and get people to start thinking about is perhaps they're behaving that way because their brain is wired differently or because their brain is wired in ways that doesn't allow them to behave the way even they would want to if you actually talk to them at different points versus other kids whose brains are wired in ways that allow them to behave in ways that are pretty typical of uh, kids who don't struggle with these kinds of issues. Rather than seeing them as character flawed or there are bad seeds or all kinds of explanations that I've heard made uh, about why these kids are, are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And the reason for that is, is because if you start thinking about how you explain behavior or what your explanation is, that starts to guide the kinds of ways in which you think about intervening with kids. And I've had a number of families come in and, and talk with me before they got educated telling me, well, my kid's just a, a bad seed, bad genetics, that's why. What do you do with that as a parent? I mean, can you think of an intervention that works? Is there anybody in the room who's a geneticist? Because that's about the only way you fix that. Um, if you begin to think about it as there's something going on in terms of how their brain processes or doesn't process information, or the way in which you're actually presenting the information to them, and there's a mismatch that's occurring, um, then you begin to get some opening for beginning to think about um, how you might begin to intervene differently, particularly with some of the kids that have some of the more behavioral um, issues. Let me go back to this. The other thing that's really interesting about the time I've spent working with families, and actually being a parent myself, I'm actually a grandfather at this point, um, with a three, three-year-old and a one-year-old um, grandchildren. So I've experienced it both going, taking my kids through this process, being a therapist, helping families go through it, and now watching and coaching uh, my daughter go through this. But if you think about it, think about where did you learn most of what you know about parenting? Anybody want to throw some ideas out? From our parents and what we didn't like about what they did. Correct. Okay. Any other places? Friends. Friends. Okay. Who probably learned it where? Their yep. Okay. Any other places? Yes. Media. Media. Absolutely. We all know how accurate they are. <laughs> yes. And part of the problem is, and you look like you've been around for a while. If you read, right? <laughs> if you've read self-help books, has anybody noticed, or have you noticed over time how they've changed pretty significantly in terms of the kinds of advice that they've been giving out? Yeah. Have you ever wondered why that is? Because they have to keep selling books. Right. Because we didn't really understand what was going on with the way kids think or the way their brains actually operate. So all those books were kind of written as, if you will, theories or hypotheses about what to do and how to raise kids, but nobody could take kids, put them in a little classroom, test out those theories and say, oh, that did or didn't work, and compare it to somebody else's way of doing it. We are getting better at that, and actually, at, I believe it's at the back of this presentation in your notes, there are gonna be a whole array of resources in terms of books, and I've got a number of them up here that you guys can feel free to come up and look at after we get finished, that are now actually starting to help us understand how to parent and how to interact with kids, um, because we're now beginning to understand why they do what they do based on what their brains are actually uh, doing. And that's what we're gonna talk about today, and that's what I hope to present. All right, now we're going to talk about us as parents for a while. Anybody want to hazard a guess that if you have to make an important decision in your life that's effective and actually helps you get to where you want to go, which one of these three minds you might make that decision out of? Nobody going to be brave and guess? Yeah, how come? Good. Where do most people make their decisions from? Good, you guys are really good. Yeah, one of the things I've discovered, and you can particularly see this in politics, if you ask people why they're voting for whoever they're voting for, most of the time, oops, sorry about that, 
they'll give you an answer that comes out of this side of their head and doesn't pay much attention to what's going on over here in the reasonable part. Now, why wouldn't effective decision making come out of just this part of the brain or this part of your mind? Does anybody know the answer to that? Yeah. Which would help with what? In what way? Yeah, let me use a quick example I think that's building on what you're saying. How many people have ever listened to the advice that financial advisors give you? And would you ever spend a penny of money on anything fun if you truly listened to everything they told you to do? That'd be the very last thing you'd do, right? Probably when you're about 70 years old, if you even could save up enough money to retire. Okay? What that doesn't pay attention to is the emotional components over here. If you've got to have some fun to move through life, because that's a part of what provides motivation. One of the things that when kids start to misbehave, I see lots of parents do, even despite their best efforts, is they start reacting out of the emotional mind. Rather than saying, let me walk away from this, take a deep breath, let me calm myself down so that I can engage this mind over here and start to come out of the wise mind, which is where you start to take into account how does my decision play out in terms of where I'm trying to go as a goal and what is it going to feel like when I get there for me and my kid. Does that make sense? Okay. How many people know that these two different minds are actually representative of different systems in the brain that are, that are biologically based? Good, we've got one. Any, any other? A couple? Good. Because what this represents is actually um, the part of the brain that, that's in the center of the brain, some people call it the lizard brain, that mediates all of our emotions, or the limbic system in the brain. So there's some of the brain anatomy behind it. However, this is representative of the frontal lobes of the brain. Does anybody know what the frontal lobes do? Yes? Executive function. Uh, that's one thing they do. We're going to talk about executive function some today, yes. Judgment, yeah. Mm -hmm. Inhibiting bad behaviors. Yes, absolutely. Um, home of the inhibitory centers in the brain. Anybody has a kid with ADHD, you will know all about the inhibitory centers in the brain, or how, why they don't work, um, in part. Um, the other interesting part is the more emotional people get, there actually is a guy who did some research on this, the less this part of the brain engages, and there's a physiological reason for that. Do people know that part of the problem with ADHD in terms of inhibition is there's not enough dopamine in the receptors in the frontal part of the brain? Good, you guys are familiar with that. And the way I kind of think about dopamine is it's a braking fluid, like in an automobile, so that when you press the brakes on, you can actually stop doing something or stop thinking something that you shouldn't be or don't want to be. Um, how many people know that when you start to get very emotional or frustrated, what actually happens is there is a flood of dopamine to the frontal part of the brain? And the flood becomes so great that what ends up happening is this part of the brain actually shuts down so that it's not operating anymore. Your frontal lobes actually disconnect from the limbic system. Now, if you think about some of the stuff you see on TV or some of the crazy behavior that you've seen either your kids do or the people do, where they just lose it, it begins to start to make some sense why that's happened. So as a parent, this is really important for us to be aware of, and obviously I'm going to encourage you to come out of the wise mind as much as possible, understanding that nobody in this room is going to be perfect. But it is really important if your kid upsets you as a parent, take a deep breath, walk away, think about it if you can, unless we're involved in a safety issue, and with safety issues all bets are off, you've got to do what you need to do to take care of your kid. Um, but to think about how you want to intervene with this, um, behavior that your kid has presented to you or the situation that you're in. You'll make a much better decision for yourself and your kid. These are the multiple roles we often find ourselves in. Teacher, a coach, disciplinarian, cheerleader, counsel. 
And this is how typically kids perceive us. You say that's a fair statement? When we get into difficult situations parenting our kids? Okay, no? It varies by age. Yeah, a lot. Not when they're six, but certainly when they're six. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, when they're six, they're probably thinking something like this, but they just don't say it. Yeah. And some of what we're going to talk about is how do you start collaborating with your kids differently so that you end up being able to spend your time in these kinds of roles rather than in this role down here. That's what I see a lot when people bring their kids in to see me in their practice, is trying to help parents unhook from some of the things they've learned from their families about how to parent kids, because the, the kids that have challenges react so differently. <clears throat> this is an interesting concept. If people don't know him, Stephen Covey um, is a management consultant who's written a number of books. Um, one of the things that stuck with me out of one of the books that I read um, called Seven High Habits of Highly Effective People is, if you don't know where you're going, you can't get there. And I will bet that not many people in this room, when their kid first popped out of the womb in the delivery room, sat there and said, let me think about exactly where I want to go with this human being and what do I want to try and help create by the time they get to be 18, 19, 20, 25 years of age. Did that occur to anybody? Has it occurred to you since then? Good. Yeah, I'm going to encourage you to, to think in those kinds of terms because if you can actually come up with a, a way or a, a, a couple of things that you want to achieve with your kid, a lot of the decisions that occur between now and the time they get to be 18, 20, 25 become much easier because all you got to do is ask yourself the question, am I headed towards this end that I said I wanted to get to or do I need to change that end and do I need to do something different? in terms of how I work with my kids. Now the interesting part is there are lots of parents, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands in here, but there are lots of parents who struggle with this issue too, because now what are we talking about? We're talking about genetics. But a lot of kids who have the kinds of troubles with LDs and ADHDs and executive function issues come from parents who genetically have passed that along to kids. So it starts to get pretty complicated when you're trying to teach a kid to do something that you have trouble with as well. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go through this. This is what happens when a parent begins to go down the road to parenting but has no plan. We don't want to see any of you end up in this circumstance. Even though there are some days when I'm sure you wake up and you wish this would have happened. <laughs> All right. How many people have ever seen this before? I'm going to give you a minute to read it. Because what this addresses is another piece of what we're going to be talking about is how everything we talk about today affects the self-esteem or self-concept of your child as you bring them from infancy to adulthood. <laughs> Everybody made it to the end? Okay. What's your answer? Does anybody know? You know what the answer is. We'd like the answer to this. You'll get it. I just want to see what your answer is. Anybody have an answer to this question? Uh, yeah, that's pretty close. Here's what he said. Pretty wise saying, and it's something I think to kind of keep in mind as you go through um, interacting with your son, daughter. Um, which one of these do you want to feed, and how do you want to feed it? And I'm hoping that I give you some ideas today and some information that will help you feed uh, positive self-esteem. And here's one of the first steps, again, borrowing from Stephen Covey. Seek first to understand, then be understood. And we were talking about a little bit about that at the opening. You're, how you understand what's going on with your kid and why they're doing what they do will direct every intervention or every parenting um, strategy that you put in place with your, 
child. So one of the most important things, I think, is to spend some time really figuring out what is going on with your kid, where are their strengths, where are their weaknesses, and we're gonna, I'm gonna give you a couple of models to help you start thinking about that. Um, we've talked about a little bit in terms of the comment in the audience in terms of executive function. Um, and again, it also comes from kind of getting out of that assumption, which we sometimes fall into, that kids are out to get us versus kids actually are trying to please us for the most part. And the younger they are, the more that's true until they become convinced they can. And then they start seeking other avenues in terms of behavior. Does that make sense to people? So if you come from the assumption that kids are always trying to do what we ask them to do, unless they can't do it, you begin to start to say, okay, well, what's getting in the way of them being able to do what I'm asking you to do? The other piece we talked about a lot is you also then begin to start to look at your child's behavior and how they respond to what you're doing with them as a barometer or a thermometer of how well what you're doing is actually working towards moving towards your goal. Now let's talk a little bit about um, self-regulation and its developmental pro uh, progression, because you guys deal with that a lot. Initially, kids, if you think about this when they're young, all of their actions are directed towards the outer world and manipulating the outer world, and there isn't a whole lot of impulse control. If you think about little infants like my granddaughter, who's one at this point, she pretty much is ready to interact with most parts of the world, isn't really able to change um, how she thinks about things at this point, um, and that's how most kids start out. Now, who else does this sound like? Teenage, what kind of teenagers? I was trying I was trying to go for how about yeah boys. Yeah, boys. There are developmental differences, and I'll show you a little bit about that in terms of beginning to think about that also. And it isn't just how we're socialized at this point. We are actually beginning to understand there are some pretty significant biological differences in terms of how our brains wire themselves that are different and make men and women better at different skills. But who's the big star in this area who, who almost always acts like this? The ADHD kids, right? Yeah, they're always oriented towards the world. You're saying no, why? Yeah, because because the, particularly the ones that display all the hyperactive behavior, they're always interacting with the world. They don't have a good self-regulatory system, so they don't have the ability to turn off turn on the off switch and say, "Well, I really shouldn't be doing that." Which is the next step? in self-development, developing the ability, or self-regulation, developing the ability to direct actions toward yourself. And what are those actions, by and large? It's your thinking. Because the younger a kid is, the more likely you are to see what they're thinking through their behavior. The older a kid is, if they start to develop self-regulation, um, the more likely you are to see it in terms of their thinking, or if they will share it with you and talk with you about it. Does that make sense? Okay. Here's our goal, our role as I see it, um, coming from the perspective of, of studying a lot about how brains develop and how brains operate. We basically, our role as our kids' parents is to act as their frontal lobes. Does that make sense? They don't have good judgment when they're little. They don't have the ability to inhibit. And our role is really to provide the structure and scaffolding as parents in the way we structure their world and intervene with them that help them learn to develop the frontal lobes of the brain. And there you go. And everybody knows that this part up here is what we're talking about. And that's where the executive functions, judgment, um, we're all located in the human brain as best we understand it at this point. So what do you move from as a parent? What are your fundamental goals when kids are little? 
Is it in pretty much taking care of their, their physical needs and also making sure that they stay safe? And then where do you end up with them if you're successful in terms of promoting uh, a child to becoming independent? You're in a skill or teaching strategies, skills, being able to help them understand how to use their executive functions to negotiate their way through the world. Problem is that lots of times we get hung up, and a lot of parenting strategies, at least in the old days, were all based on the concept or came out of the notion that we always had to keep our kids safe. No matter what, no matter what. So therefore, a lot of times people would interfere with their kids' ability to develop a lot of these skills. And I was actually talking before this presentation to a mom out in the hallway. Uh, I don't see her here. Yeah, there we go. And this is a big issue in terms of how do parents go from a safety-based approach, which is really important when kids have no frontal lobes, to beginning the process of letting go um, of their ability to get out in the world and to experience things and to learn from the consequences of their own behavior. And just to give you a quick example, um, because I also do evaluations of my practice, and one of the things that, and this is going to sound a little bit sick, so bear with me here, but when I get a family that comes in that a school is not recognized, their kid has a learning problem or has a significant ADHD problem and executive function problems, and therefore has been unwilling to be helpful to them, one of the things that I'm most glad to hear before they get to high school is that they have a D or an F on their report card. Do you have any idea why that is? Because that's what in the public school systems, and I know it's different here in McLean, triggers in them the notion, hey, there's something wrong with this kid. This kid's got an issue. My hope is always that we can, if we can figure out what's going on with this kid, we can prevent that from happening. Because then you get into issues around what does that mean about how it affects their self-esteem. If you remember the um, tale from the uh, wise Indian. Because by the time they typically get that beat up, their self-concept as a learner is probably in the toilet. And that's another issue you then have to, to try and deal with. And I understand one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Rebecca Resnick, was here talking this morning about the whole concept of kids who have trouble with motivation. How many people know that, that kids with ADHD and exact function disorders, that is also becoming known in, the, in at least the professional community, it's probably been well known by you guys for a long time, as a disorder of motivation. That it is a fundamental hallmark of ADHD. People, are people aware of that? Some are, some are. Yeah, because I always get people who come in and want to have people evaluated and then start talking to me about their kids being lazy or unable to do things because they just aren't trying hard enough. And my experience with these kinds of kids is they try tremendously hard, they just don't succeed in the same way everybody else does. And once they become convinced they can't, they do start going through a process where they become demotivated. So as they get older, it gets more and more difficult. Okay, real quickie, just in terms of development, because I know we've got a range of people that are in this audience. These are actually um, functional magnetic resonance images of the human brain, and these are composites, these are not of one person, starting at age five and going all the way down to, tw to age 20. And one of the things that you'll notice is, look at the frontal part of the brain in terms of how active it isn't. Because the deeper the blue, the more active the region is. Come down here at eight, you start to see a little more, 12, moving into adolescence, a little more at 16, you see a little more, then by the age of 20, you're seeing a lot more. Do people know actually how long it takes for the average human brain to actually mature? Yeah. Do you know who figured that out first? If you've ever gone to rent a car, what age? Yeah, 25 years old before you can rent a car. They had it figured out a long time ago. And it was based on accident reports. Um, because people at that age start to have better judgment, their frontal lobes are fully hooked up. And I want to say something really important about this in terms of brain development. If you're dealing with a kid that has um, learning issues or executive function problems or ADHD, which are the most common ones, you can expect your kid to on, on average have a delay of about two to three years in the development of those skills. 
So if you think about them chronologically in terms of how old they are, you shouldn't be applying parenting strategies that everybody else is doing just because they're that age. You need to really be thinking and watching what's going on with their behavior because you need to be applying strategies that work for their brain age, which is what we're really talking about. Yes? If, if, the, if the brain also then, if it were to show up there, would it show two years behind? A 20-year-old with ADHD would show less, less development? Yeah, there's some research out there that actually says, when he mentioned that it was 25 years of age, that it actually takes up to about 30 for people that have ADHD. So, yes, it probably would. I'm not familiar with anybody who's actually demonstrated that, that, but I'm sure that's what we would probably say. Yeah, it's not based in um, what's going on in their environment as much as it's based in what's going on with brain development. And that's kind of what this whole talk is about, is beginning to think about kids and how they develop and react based on these kinds of principles. Yeah? No. I mean, yes, you can, but no, you don't have to. See, what, one of the things that I talked about a little bit before that we're going to talk about as we keep going through this is watch your kid's behavior. Your kid will tell you what they are capable of doing, by and large. Because most adolescents that I've ever worked with, what's the one thing that they want that they truly don't understand what it means? Say it? Yeah, grow up. And I tell most of the adolescents I work with, hey, slow down, you really don't want to get there so fast. You don't really understand what that means. Yeah, they all want to be grown-ups, but they really don't have any idea what that means in terms of what it means to be responsible, what it means to take responsibility for all of the decisions that you have to make, how you have to create plans, structure them, follow them through. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in terms of exact functions. Yes? Um, and I also want to say something else. Um, right after I answer your question about genetic versus acquired, because there isn't a difference in these kids in terms of how they parent and how they learn that's pretty significant, yes. The idea of learning from your mistakes, or learning from experience, um, or the idea of adapting to new situations because they change, mm -hmm. how does that fit into like which part of the brain, an executive function part of the brain? Because a child who doesn't really learn from past, from, he, he, he doesn't move on to a new, to a new, try something different. He just keeps doing the same thing the same way, even though it has demonstrated itself 1,000 times. Okay. It's not the way to go. How does that work? Out? Hang on to that question, because I'm going to have a slide that I think starts to directly address that issue. And then if I don't answer your question, then ask it again. Okay. I wanted to make a comment about genetic versus acquired. Um, there is a, there is, ADHD is not a, what we call homogeneous, or they're not all the same. They don't look all the same. So as we talk about some of this, and I talk about some, make some general statements about ADHD, for those parents who have kids that don't quite fit what we talk about, don't worry about it, because there are all kinds of variations of it. And part of it is because ADHD is, has been labeled the penultimate, um, executive function disorder, and we're going to, I'm going to show a slide that shows most of the executive functions that will partly answer the question over here. But I also want to say something else. One of the things that we are beginning to look at a little bit better, um, and I've actually seen Russell Barkley, who is an a internationally renowned researcher in ADHD, talk about, is that there is a difference between kids who acquire these kinds of problems with brain function versus ones who genetically um, get them, or that there are delays in development based on genetics. And pretty much what that means is if you have a long history of ADHD or LD in your family and your kid pops out and has it, you can be pretty assured that that's a genetic version of it. If there is no history in your family and something unusual happened during the birth process, they had a head injury, they got sick and had a, had a disease that somehow affected the development of the brain, You've now got a kid that's got an acquired either ADHD, reading disability, disorder of written expression, whatever the label is that you want to use for it. 
And those kids react very differently to both parenting and to teaching strategies. In that, what we're beginning to discover is kids that have the genetic variant seem to respond better to treatment and respond more quickly, whereas kids who have the acquired versions tend to take much longer to respond and require a lot more effort and a lot more structure um, to get them to the same place that you might get a kid who's got a genetic variant of it. So that's also something to be aware of. And I'll say something really quick. It can be as simple as a kid experiencing a period of, of anoxia during the birth process that then comes out ADHD when you go see somebody like me or go to your primary care physician and nobody in the family has it and everybody's going, well, why did that happen? You're probably not dealing with the genetic variant. You're probably dealing with an acquired variant. Yeah. They don't respond as well to medication either. It's, 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 yeah, there's a much larger effect in genetic, in genetic populations and much less effect in the acquired populations. And again, this is a kind of an emerging concept, so it's not been really studied very well. Uh, but I just wanted to throw that out there because it was something that I discovered as I was getting ready for this workshop. And I think it's pretty important in terms of you all as parents, if you've got somebody that's got an acquired problem, are going to have a harder time with that kid. And it isn't about making you feel bad as a parent or not successful. You just need to understand it's going to take long. And a lot more intervention to work with a kid who's dealing with that versus a more genetic variety. Um, this is what I was referring to before, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time with this, but this is um, showing the difference between how the male brain, and this is done through something called diffuse tensor imaging, which looks at how the white matter in the brain is actually connecting. Um, and in males, you can see there's this connection from front to back that facilitates a more direct going from point A to point B problem solving approach. Yeah, I see you laughing back there. <laughs> We're the ones who sit down in relationships when our wives talk to us and we want to solve the problem and they get mad at us because all they want to do is be heard. <laughs> yeah, I've been there, done that. <laughs> Learn my lesson. Um, and here's the female variant of it, which is look at all of the crossing between the two hemispheres. <coughs> and basically what that's good for is being able to operate in context and in interpersonal relationships. Imagine that. <laughs> So it's interesting that we're starting to see is, and this is as kids get into adolescence, where we're starting to see this divergence in brain development that, that we didn't have a biological way to look at before. Okay, executive functions, probably the bane of you all's existence as parents. Um, and one of the things I want to point out is, as we talk about this, this is a model that was developed by a guy named Dr. Jerry Joya. Any of you have been to Children's Hospital, you probably are aware of him. He's one of the neuropsychologists. In fact, I think he's the chief neuropsychologist there at this point. Um, he and a uh, gentleman named Peter Isquith um, developed this model, and it is the model that underlies a very famous questionnaire most psychologists send out called the brief. If you've ever had that done to your kid or as a teacher ever seen that come to your classroom, these are the executive functions in one form. There are models that go from four or five executive functions all the way up to about 32 of them. I'm not going to get into all that, but this is a relatively simple way to understand it. Um, and it starts down here with the fundamental building block that we were talking about, about developing the self-regulatory system. So the rule of thumb is, if you don't have this in place, you're not going to get the ability to change yourself through all of these kinds of skills developing. So if you can't inhibit yourself, it's hard for you to be able to, to sit and apply um, strategies of thoughts internally to develop, to develop these different skills. Now how many people are familiar with executive functions because I want to know about how much time I should spend with it. Good. Okay. We don't have to spend a lot then. Is everybody familiar with the ones that are up here? Is there anyone that I need to explain to folks? Yes. Shift referred to shift your strategy. issue. <laughs> yeah, that you were talking about actually. Shift is also called mental flexibility. 
It's the ability to either alter your behavior when, when you are faced with a transition. So for instance, if you're at home and you cook dinner and a kid's watching TV and you ask them to come um, to dinner and you have to ask them 50 times to get there, probably a problem either here or it could be that they can't stop so they're having trouble inhibiting. It's also in technical neuropsych terms called perseverative behavior. They get stuck and they just keep doing the behavior over and over and over again and can't get out. So does that help answer the question you were asking before about why they may not learn? They may be learning, but what may be going on is they can't actually make that shift without some external intervention. Because do you all know how you deal with all these issues? Really? Nobody ever told you this. Wow, I'm surprised. Remember the slide, a couple of slides ago when we talked about parents being the frontal lobes of the brain? You've got to take over these functions for your kid. You actually have to put them in place in their environment for your kid to be able to function. That's how you do it. It's by structuring their world so that they actually can work until, hopefully, these skills come online. And I say hopefully because there are lots of people who make it into adulthood who don't develop a lot of these skills. And I'm sure we all know some. Yes? <coughs> Okay, hang on for a second. I want to see if these folks have picked up part of what I've... How would you know that, the answer to that question, based on what we've talked about so far? Bingo. If, he, if your child can't do it when you withdraw the structure, then it means their brain hasn't developed the ability to do it. Now, what would you be told from the traditional parenting model? Bingo. You're not allowing your kid to grow up. You're model coddling them. Yeah, there's all kinds of negative stuff you'll hear. But if you've ever worked with kids that have these problems, you can stop as much as you want. They'll never display it. Yeah. position. And I actually do not. The position of we shouldn't do anything and there should be no limits for kids. Because I'm a firm believer that part of what's going on with a lot of kids that struggle with this stuff is they require a very intensive kind of parenting, but it's different than what traditionally we've been taught to do. And you're going to see some of that as we start running through some of this. What I call, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. And I believe, because um, I had talked to one of the school counselors here a number of years ago about a family that I work with that came to McLean. Did not a, a gentleman named Dr. Ross Green come and talk to, to you at this school at one point? How many people are familiar with the book, The Explosive Child, Lives in the Balance, .org? I think that's in, in the handout on executive functions. Um, there is an approach to working with kids who have this issue. Typically, they are the kids that throw a lot of temper tantrums. They're also affectionately in my field called oppositional defiant disorder, which I wish they would get rid of. 
because I don't think it has anything to do with them being oppositional. I think it's their brains don't shift gears, they can't modulate their emotions, and they can't inhibit themselves. Um, and that's the big problem that they really struggle with. Um, but that's, I think, a reflection of how much misunderstanding there's been about these kids that my profession has not even moved away from those kinds of labels for them at this point. Um, yeah, and there's a technique that you actually can engage that he talks about, which is essentially a three-step process that you walk through with those kids. And the reason for it is it's providing external structure or acting as their frontal lobe to get them calmed down first. Because if you don't get them calmed down, remember what happens to the frontal lobes of the brain, they're going to disconnect and they're not going to be able to problem solve nor listen to anything you have to say. And in fact, I've got a slide that shows that usually what happens is parents either have the choice at that point to throw water on a burning fire or gasoline. And lots of times they throw gasoline on it, mostly out of frustration because they don't know what to do. Yeah, I don't believe parents are evil either. They're struggling just as hard with all this stuff as the kids are trying to do what they want them to do. But if you do that repeatedly over time and give that kid enough practice, the thinking behind it is you will actually create the wiring in the brain that's necessary for them to be able to start taking that over on an independent basis. And that comes out of a lot of the research on brain plasticity that says if you do something long enough, your brain gets good at it. And those regions of the brain become more densely packed with neurons because those, there are more connections being made. We don't know for sure. I don't know that there's any research that's taking groups of kids like this, applied his strategy over time prospectively, and then said, did they turn out better? But that's what the belief is based on what we understand about the, the brain science. Now, there are some people who get to be adults who will still struggle with this stuff. And sometimes it's helping them learn what they have to do in terms of self-management strategies to be able to manage it when it starts to happen. That is also a part of the technique Green teaches. Because it is actually teaching kids an awareness of what physiologically is going on inside when they start to get upset and using that as a cue to be able to start intervening with some of the metacognitive strategies, so let's just walk away, take a break, um, deep breathe, whatever you need to do to relax so you can re-engage the, the frontal part of the brain again. I hope that answered your question. Kind of a long question, but anyway. Going back to, here's the primary rule that I believe we all break. How many people feel responsible for their kids' behavior, for their kids' learning? Yeah, how come? I mean, for anybody who's, and, and I, I didn't discover this, but this is what all the, the people that I work with have taught me. You cannot control another human's, uh, another human's behavior or ability to learn. And the public schools in this county, I mean, in this country, are in deep trouble. Because what's happening right now is we are heading in a direction where teachers are being held accountable for students' learning. What happened to the student? They're the one that's in control of their brain, or not as the case may be, as we've been talking about. Um, and, and I believe this is a principle that if you um, don't follow or are not respectful of, will get you in trouble. I don't care what the relationship you're in. I don't care who you're dealing with, whether it's boss, friend, principal, kid, um, your spouse, you will always be in trouble if you try and avoid this and take over the responsibility for something you can't control. Now, does that start to sound like, well, we might as well not do anything? Doesn't it? Well, wait a minute. Doesn't it a little bit? Yeah, well, there's rule number two that's coming, so don't worry. There's help at hand. Yeah. What I meant by when I asked are you responsible, lots of people, like if you, if you run into a, and I'll give you a, an example behaviorally and then come back to see if it answers it. If you run into a parent who's in the store, who's got a kid that's tantruming on the floor, is that parent responsible for that kid tantruming on the floor? Have you ever seen the poor mom who's embarrassed to doubt trying to get the kid to stop? Doesn't do any good, because usually what's happening is the mom is feeding the intensity of the emotional reaction, and because there's no frontal lobe, that kid just keeps tantrum. That's what I'm talking about, is you can't control it. There are things you can do to manage it, 
And that's what we're going to, as we move through this, I think you'll see some of those pieces fall into place. And I want to keep moving because we're going to start running out of time. But it's really important. Read this real quick, but this is a great example of what I'm talking about. Because no human being on this planet likes being told what to do. Can't make it. Want me to read it for you? Yeah. Okay. I did not want to go with them. Alas, I had no choice. This was made quite clear to me in threatening tones of voice. I protested mightily and scrambled across the floor, but though I grabbed the furniture, they dragged me out the door. In the car, I screamed and moaned. I cried my red eyes dry. The window down, I yelled for help. The people we passed by. Mom and Dad can make the rules and certain things forbid, but I can make them wish that they had never had a kid. <laughs> And that's what you set in motion with kids. And if you think about it, when people tell you what to do, isn't there an active two or three year old you that says, I really don't want to do that. Now, you may have enough inhibitory centers in your brain and enough judgment to be able to say, well, I better do it anyway. But there's almost that gut reaction inside of people. And that's what I'm talking about, stay away from it. So that one of the big things I try and encourage parents to do, don't get in power struggles with your kids. You're in control. You don't need to go there. And I'm going to show you how. Because of rule number two, the law of consequences. This is what you've got the ability to manage. Is what consequences befall your child if they agree to comply or if they don't. Does that make sense? It also teaches the process of learning from experience. Now, why wouldn't you do this, or why wouldn't you allow this to happen? Go back to the example I was talking about. Remember I said I got really excited when the kid came through the door and had an F in school? And I'm sure the parents, when I said it, because I'll say this kind of thing, I'm really glad that happened. And of course, the parents look at me like I'm out of my mind, or I'm some sick psychologist. And I'll say to them, no, you don't understand, because this gives us what we need to now move forward. The other issue is to use getting that app as a learning opportunity for that kid to understand what is it that you did or didn't do that got you into this position. And I cannot tell you the number of kids that are in that kind of a position because everybody's telling them they have to do this and they have to do that and they have to do this and they're acting like that little kid that was in that cartoon that I read to you where they're saying, yeah, well, you can keep telling me that, but I don't have to do it. It doesn't work very well. And the other thing is, is it starts to erode your relationship with your kid, which is not a great place to be in. Now, the other question that often people um, get hung up in is using natural versus manipulated consequences. So if a kid at school fails or gets, doesn't turn his homework in and gets a bad grade, what should you do as a parent? Should you then ground them at home because they got bad grades? Yeah, but lots of people go that extra mile and work a lot harder than they have to. So instead of using the consequence that's already out there, they now become the person who the kid gets angry at. Because, you know, before they were angry at the school, great opportunity to say, let's see if we can team together and figure out why this happened, what you need to do differently the next time so you can avoid getting an F if that's not what you wanted to get. And they miss the opportunity to build the relationship with their kid in a positive direction. So they'll punish them yet again. And you're going to see where I uh, fall in terms of punishment. So I basically believe let your kid, unless it's an issue of safety, suffer as many natural consequences as possible. Your job is to coach them and help them learn from those experiences, to understand what their skills and weaknesses are cognitively, going back to all those executive functions, and to figure out strategies that will help them achieve where they want to go rather than to add another punishment on top. And this is an example of a natural punishment for consequence occurring. <laughs> Great. You, parent, you don't have to do anything. Kid will learn. Okay? And here's a manipulated one. Now, the kid did this one. I don't know what he's angry at his dad for. <clears throat> But that one was a lot of work, the other one just happened naturally. Now here's the big question. 
Do you use punishment or do you use rewards or incentives to change behavior as a parent? What were we taught? Yeah. How come? I'm going to give you two examples of a purely punishment-based system and a purely incentive-based system that operate in our culture right now. Anybody familiar with speed cameras? Yeah. Take a minute and think about human behavior around speed cameras. They're all, it's all punishment-based, because all you get is an invitation from the state to donate 40 bucks to them, right? Yeah, no, none of us want to give 40 more bucks to the state, although I'm going to prove that wrong in another minute. So what people do is they get right up to that white line, jam on the brakes, they drive a speed limit, and then they get on the other side of it and they speed right back up. Now, as a parent, is that what you that the effect you want to have on your kids' behavior? So that the only time they behave is when you're around watching what they do and all the rest of the time they do whatever they're going to do anyway? Probably not. That's not real effective. Now, the other piece is, is when you have to deliver that ticket, they don't like you very much. Because if you've ever been pulled over by a police officer for a speeding ticket, I don't care how nice they are to you, you still don't like the fact you're getting a speeding ticket. And you have these reactions like, this really isn't fair, 50 other people were driving just as fast as me, and they never got them, why'd you pick on me? And that's as an adult, and all that stuff's going on in your kids as well. Now, let's go to the incentive side. The other naturally occurring way in which incentives are used, and you can see them operate, is how many people in this room like to pay taxes? Anybody? Good, you all are saying. Um, I know you pay them because you think you have a, a social duty, et cetera, et cetera. But how many people, and you don't have to raise your hands, who don't like paying taxes participate in the lottery, especially when it goes up $680 million? as the prize. You don't have to raise your hands. Yeah, I didn't want to embarrass anybody. Did you know that you're paying taxes to the government? That that's all the lottery system is? So how do they get people to have fun and give their money to the government when they claim they don't want to give them any more than they're already taking? It's all incentive based. So why as a parent would you not want to use that knowledge in your relationship with your kid to influence their behavior? And there is a handout you guys have, because we're probably not going to get all the way there, um, that should look something like this, called Lessons from a Dancing Chicken. And it's, and it's presented in a funny, humorous way. But what it talks about is how you use incentives to shape human behavior, to get people to do things that they don't want to do without them even knowing you're doing it. And if we had more time, I could give you a whole bunch of examples of that. But that's how you work, that's how you influence kids' behavior. Is because you use natural consequences, but instead of framing things like, I'm going to have to take your iPhone away from you because you don't, are not doing your homework. Flip it around. It's really simple. You earn your iPhone every day that you get your homework done and show me that you've got it, and those days you don't, I get it back. Because typically it's your iPhone, it's not theirs. You gave it to them. They didn't go out and earn it. At least most of them. So why not put it in that term? Because the other thing it teaches is you have to do something to get something in life. Isn't that independence of what we as adults have to do? So it helps set some of the groundwork for getting your kids to a place where they will understand what's going to be required of them as an adult. Um, effective discipline from my point of view, is using as many incentives. Yes? Well, I don't know about the previous thing. With, I try to tell my kids they can't go on the computer until they've done all their homework. They see it as withholding. Even though I say it's, I'm trying to use it as a reward, they still feel I'm withholding. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of protesting. Um, so even trying to use the semantics differently, they see it. I go into my Colombo routine at that point. What I would say is, wait a minute, I'm really confused. All you have to do is your homework, and then you have this opportunity. It's not clear to me why you're not now doing your homework so that you can use the computer instead of sitting here arguing with me, because the longer you argue with me, the less time you have to use the computer. It's up to you. But it's up to them. 
And then the other thing is... And, and the other thing I want to say is, and then you may use that as a way to say, okay, maybe my kid has some problems with shifting, too, in terms of mental flexibility. Because why would I sit there and complain to you if you've given me the option of, oh, if I can just go do this, I can get what I want. So it also helps you start to think about where is your kid having trouble. And I might, at that point, become even a little more dramatic with them, but always pointing out, it's their behavior that's causing this reaction. It's not me. Yeah, and they don't like it at first. I will agree. But if you make this shift consistently, they, they, you'll begin to see bigger changes in their behavior. Right, so the other thing that's been happening as homework escalates, that I, I make all screens go off at 8 o'clock, and um, sometimes the homework takes a good amount of time. And, you know, my son said, there's no way I could finish before 8 o'clock, so there's no point. Like, it became about the reward. He said, why would I do my homework if I'm not going to get computer time anyway? Yeah, so that's a tricky one. Yeah, and then what I would say is at that point you may want to start th rethinking how, about some of the rules you've got set up so that you can become a little more flexible in how you start applying them to a kid. Or even if on a single night that happens and you're aware it's going to happen, yeah, but if you do this, I'm still willing to let you watch something from 8.30 to 9 o'clock or be on the computer from 8.30 to 9. So, yeah. Any other quick questions? I want to keep moving. Yes. We had an earlier presenter who said reward systems are less effective with ADHD kids because of the brain chemistry of, I don't know what was built in one of those things, that it has less of a beneficial impact for those kids. Those and those things were kind of rewarding intrinsically motivated, those behaviors will increase that intrinsic motivated behavior. Say that part again. I could intrinsically motivated behavior and you start rewarding it, you'll actually get less of it. Somebody just wants to do something because they're good, and then you start uh, saying, Oh, we're going to do this because you did it. Then you start getting less of their intrinsic motivation. I heard that, but I didn't hear it at the same point. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can address the first point and then the second point. Um, there is truth in what you heard. In my experience, what's been shown with ADHD kids is that they satiate on novelty or they get used to things that you offer them as incentives relatively quickly. So if you keep using the same incentive over and over again, you will start to see their ability to respond to it go away because it's no longer novel. The way around that, at least that I've discovered it with the folks I work with, is you get the kid to generate a menu of rewards that they're willing to earn and you go through the rewards so that they aren't earning something to the point that it becomes unknown. And you rotate it, if you will. The other issue with ADHD kids is the rewards typically have to be more immediate to the behavior, and they have to be more powerful than non-ADHD kids. And so if you've got a reinforcement system that's set up that's not working, those would be the couple of things that I'd be looking at is changing the incentives so that they're more immediate, more short-term. I've had parents come in and tell me, well, I told them at the end of the week they would get to do X, Y, and Z if they were able to do their homework all week and it doesn't work. My suggestion at that point is let's break, bring it back and break it up into first every day offering an incentive of some type and let's see if they respond to that. Because if they can respond to that, what it's telling me is that reward was too far away. Because a lot of kids with ADHD have working memory issues, remember that executive function? They can't keep the fact that that reward's going to be there in mind for a week, and therefore they don't respond to it. So that's a potential explanation for some of that. But in my experience, I've not seen kids not respond to an incentive system just across the board, if they're well designed and kind of tweaked right, depending on the kid. And how do we know whether they're working? Watch their behavior. Absolutely. So if they start responding, then you know your system's working. If they don't respond, then it's not working. And you, need, you know you need to do something different. And the other, said about the intrinsic versus extrinsic? The former yes. Um, see, what I would argue with that is, is that ADAC kids are intrinsically motivated to do what they want to do. And you can't interfere with that. I don't care what you do. Um, how many people have ADHD kids that love playing video games? Yeah, 
And you know, one of the amazing parts to me is I'll sit and talk to one of those kids, and they can tell me everything about the characters, what their powers are, um, all the enemies, what they et cetera, and go through a bazillion things. Well, what do you have to do for homework tonight? They can't tell me a thing about. It. Yeah. So if they're interested in it, they can engage all of these um, executive functions and all of these learning skills. If they're not, it, you've got to incentivize them externally to get them to stay engaged because it's hard for them to stay motivated. Remember I said ADHD is, is also by nature a motivational disorder? Yeah, and that's, that's beginning to be talked about more. It's been not as much talked about before, yes. Question and a comment. Uh, what role does technology play in uh, helping students learn and staying attention for prolonged periods of time? That's a question then. I actually don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I know there have been some studies out that were pretty flawed that talked about that if kids watch enough television, they become ADHD. Essentially, those studies were backwards. What was happening was kids with ADHD watched lots of television, but they didn't control for that variable. Um, I've not seen anything that actually suggests their attention spans are becoming shorter because of media-based interventions. In fact, one of the things that um, I often use in terms of encouraging kids and families is to use smartphones for a lot of those executive functions in the human brain because they work so freaking well for people in terms of helping accommodate for something their brain doesn't do, particularly as they get older, like in high school and college. Yeah. Any other quick questions? That's what I want you to become, behavioral scientist. Do lots of experiments with your kids, mad scientists, whatever you want to have fun with and call it. But learn from the interventions and um, what happens and how your kid responds. Let me, I'm going to skip over this. This is a, just an easy way to kind of structure um, thinking about how you might intervene with your kid in terms of a strategy. We're running out of time, so I want to get to a couple of things. This is a really important. This is something I try and teach everybody that comes through the door. We are so used to everything that we are doing wrong, partly because of the way the educational system is set up. When you get a test back, they never pointed out what you did right. They always gave you red X's for what you did wrong. Correct? Anybody have a teacher who checked everything that you did right? Nobody? I had one in one audience once. Um, so we stay focused on this and we begin to see not getting things done right as failure. Well, if you failed at something, are you motivated to go back and try it again? No, and I hope, uh, maybe this is a part of what Rebecca talked about, but if you looked at it as feedback, wait a minute, let me see what I can learn about me, what, I, what can I learn about how my brain operates, what can I learn about what I need to do differently, you get a lot of information that helps you generate a lot of ideas about, okay, now what can I try next? And there's a famous story about Thomas Alva Edison. I don't know if you're all familiar with it. Neighbor walked into his garage in his backyard once after about a thousand times of trying to fix the, invent the electric light bulb and said to him, you know, you're just crazy. I can't believe you're doing this. Why don't you give up? You've been at this for years. And his response back was, no, I'm not. He says, I know a thousand whatever odd ways that it won't work now. And that's kind of the attitude that I'm talking about beginning to learn today. Uh, LEAP is another um, just an acronym for a way to look at kind of the learning process. And again, we're going to skip over that. We've got about five minutes. I want you guys to be brave to, to fail in the old way we're talking about it often. Okay, and to learn from your successes as well as failures. And the last thing I'm going to say to you all before you leave is, this is a lot of work. Being a parent is a ton of work. So I would encourage you all to make sure, and this is really hard for moms in my experience, we've got a room full of moms in here, take time for yourself. Because if you don't take time for yourself, I saw that look. If you don't take time for yourself, you're not going to have the energy to take care of your kids. And the metaphor that I always use is, it's like going out into to an orchard and watering and fertilizing one tree and seeing what happens to the fruit and doing nothing for the other one and making a comparison. Your kids will be much better off 
So anyway, take care of yourselves, have some fun, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. And I'm here for planning.